So, Greg, it's all yours. All right. So, let's see. Do I get this on? There we go. All right. So, how's it ready? So, uh, quick, quick, kind of break the ice, kind of stuff going on. Do you hear about the uh, butcher who uh, accidentally backed into the meat grinder? He got a little behind in his work. Uh, uh, I had to do that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I enjoy a lot of puns. In fact, I uh, once wrote a theatrical production about puns. It was a play on words. <laughs> so, um, anyhow. <laughs> With that said, I'm going to get started. Um, so, quick show of hands, just to get an idea. We, we, I didn't turn around and look. I'm just curious most, more than anything. How many of you use IntelliJ again? How many of you use uh, some, some flavor of Eclipse? All right, how many, and there's like two people that use NetBeans? Yeah, there's usually just one or two people. Also curious, has nothing to do with this talk. I am just curious, how many of you use Maven? How many of you use Gradle? How many of you use Ant and Ivy? Wow, there's more hands. Usually it's the same people who use NetBeans. <laughs> it's surprising. All right, so uh, yeah, this is this is the title slide. This is what we're going to talk about tonight. Actually, the talk takes a kind of a three-part act. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, just kind of what reactor, Reactive is, a little bit about the Project Reactor, and then the, uh, the last bit is actually where we start talking about Spring, so we'll kind of lead up into that. Um, of course, this is who I am. This is where you can email me if you want to uh, catch up with me after we're done here uh, with any questions. Of course, I, I'll, I'll be welcome to field any questions you have during the talk. Uh, just raise your hand, I'll ignore you, or I'll, I'll call on you, or, or what have you. Uh, here's uh, where I live on Twitter, where I tweet about whatever I happen to be thinking about at the time. It could be any topic at all, technology or otherwise. And here's where I live on GitHub. And pertaining to this particular subject, I don't have any code out on GitHub yet, but this example uh, some of the examples I've been working on, uh, tinkering around with this stuff, as well as writing some other real code, uh, eventually we'll find a home out there. Uh, kind of sad, the, the thing I work on day to day uh, it does live on GitHub, but you can't see it because it's in a private repo, it's not open source, I'm sorry. Uh, I wish I could share it with you because it's some cool stuff, but uh, alas. All right, so with that said, uh, we're going to talk about reactive programming and uh, primarily, and so what is, uh, what is this reactive thing and why should you care? Ultimately, I'd like to draw on all four of these points by simply saying it's a style of programming that is the, you know, it says the opposite of imperative. But it means that we're going to be able to do things in a concurrent way without too much thinking about concurrency, without really focusing a lot of uh, brain power on concurrency. How many of you, and I usually see one or two hands when I ask this question, but, oh yeah, there's people over there, cool. Hey, uh, how you doing? So, uh, I usually, uh, get a couple of hands, but sometimes I get nobody's hands, and I would be surprised if everybody raised their hand. Don't do it just to mess with me. How many of you, when you start writing concurrent code, start dealing with threads, start doing this kind of stuff, how many of you think, man, I love this stuff. This is awesome. <laughs> you have a bumper sticker on your car that says, I heart threads. <laughs> yeah, there's usually one or two people who really geek out over that kind of thing. I'm not one of those people, because threads make my head hurt. Uh, there's just, it's just hard for me to keep those kind of things uh, sorted out in my head. And so it's kind of nice when you start dealing with reactive programming, you don't have to so much think about threads as much. You don't have to think about the fact that this is all asynchronous and non-blocking and things are getting processed as they show up. You don't have to think about that stuff. There's all sorts of cool things you can do with reactive programming that you don't have to, uh, to, to just think about. But it does require you to program a little bit differently. You're no longer programming an imperative model where you're just listing off, do this, and when you're done with that, do this, and when you're done with that, do this. You're, you're more or less saying, okay, here's what's gonna happen. Some data's gonna show up sometime. I don't know when it's gonna show up. And it may just continue to show up over a period of time. I don't know. And, but when, as it shows up, do this stuff. You react to it. You react to some, something happening. And then you do something on that. And there's no general assumption of what thread anything takes place in. Depending on how you code it, everything may happen in the same thread. Everything may happen in different threads. It may be pulled from uh, you know, some threads may get to re be reused because they're part of a pool. You don't know, you don't really think about it too much. You just tell it what needs to happen. So what's wrong with imperative? Well, you know, imperative's cool. I like imperative. Everybody here probably loves imperative. We've worked with it for years and we feel comfortable with it. Most of you, I'm guessing, are like me. This is the kind of programming you were uh, brought up on. This is the, uh, how you uh, cut your teeth in programming is imperative programming. 
the gotcha is if you look at code like this, and there's a, like this repository at the top, and I'm going to fetch some products from it, and you just got to wait for a moment to fetch. You can't do anything with that list of products until they're all there. As a consequence, the calling thread is blocked, and you can't process those items until they're all fetched. And it's actually worse. Uh, I've actually, I can't say I've actually experienced this, but I've, I've pondered what if this, this repository of products where I'm saying find all, what if this is like, you know, Amazon's database? And you're saying, okay, I want you to find all the products. I mean, it's a huge number of products. I don't know that this would happen, but I'm willing to wager that before you would ever get a chance of processing, you're going to run out of memory. Because it's having to load all those things up into a list, it's consuming memory. And so you have a larger footprint, you can't do anything with them until they're all loaded. The calling threads blocked, there's no asynchronicity, it's just there. But it's natural, it's understandable. You know that once you get that list, you know, okay, now I can work on this stuff. Downside is you have to wait till they're all there, you have to wait till they're all piled up together. And the way I like to think of this is, what if you uh, decided you wanted to subscribe? Anybody here still subscribe to paper magazines? Anyone? Yeah, very few hands usually go up for that one. Okay, but let's just say hypothetically, you, know, you go back in time, back when you used to do that kind of thing. You're at the dentist office and you're sitting there waiting, and you have to see, you know, you know, Sports Illustrated or Time or Highlights for Children, whatever it is you like. And you say to myself, you say to yourself, you know, I think I want to get this magazine. And let's just say, for the sake of discussion, this all happens, to, you know, the beginning of the year toward the end of the year. And so you you fill out a little card, you send it in, you send give your payment information, and January comes along, and you don't get your magazine. You think, okay, well maybe there's a delay. Okay, I just did four to six weeks. Okay, great. Okay, so February comes along, the magazine. You're starting to get a little concerned because you see that the payment's clear to the bank, but you still haven't received the magazine. March comes along, no magazine. Now you're concerned, so you call them up, say, hey, what's the deal? I subscribed to your magazine, you took payment for the subscription, I haven't received any magazines yet. And they say, sir, ma'am, sorry, uh, you subscribed to 12 magazines. We didn't say when you were going to get them, we have to wait for them all to pile up, and then we're going to send you all the magazines at once. And so by the time you get all of the magazines in, in December, first off, there's a bigger package they got shipped, but also, uh, by that time, you already sort of know who won the Super Bowl, and you've read all the interviews, and it's, you know the World, you know, World Series may be somewhat still fresh, but you know things like that. You, you, you pretty much know this stuff. You can't. Um, it, it's not good. This is not how magazines work. And this is the same idea. I'm, I'm asking it for stuff, and I could process this stuff as it came along. I could read these things as they came along and work with them, but I have to wait for another show. That kind of sucks. All right, so what, not a, what, what is the Java future not about it? The Java future solves this problem, right? Well, it does, in a sense. It, it, it says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to go fetch some, actually, I, I need to tweak that example a little bit. I know it's just notice the typo in there. Um, but what if I, uh, I ask for all these products, and the products come back, and but except, except instead of getting the products coming back, I'm getting a future coming back. Now, I, that means that it doesn't block when I say, fine, but fine. Well, let's say it says find by ID, mentally replace it with find all, if you will. I, I've gone and asked it for this, it said find all, it, it, it doesn't block, it comes back right away. My thread, my calling thread is able to just continue doing whatever my calling thread needs to do. And then at some time in the future, I can, uh, that, I can ask the, uh, the future, well, do you have the, the information yet? No? Okay, let's keep trying, we, and eventually we're going to get it. And it's still the same problem. The calling thread's not blocked, but I still can't do anything with this stuff till they're all there. Well, oh yeah, what you mail is a completable future. Well, it's the same idea. The difference is I'm, I'm able to sort of compose stuff on top of it now. I can sort of say, okay, when this is complete, do this. It's the same idea, but I don't keep calling get, essentially. And so I'm still waiting for all this stuff to show up. It still comes in a bit all at once, and I, I'm still it, it, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm still processing the entire collection as it shows up. It's a little bit better. It's not really good for what we call hot data, which is essentially the idea that you may join this subscription as it comes along. Imagine subscribing to a magazine and you went ahead and sent that in and suddenly you got, you know, all the issues of Sports Illustrated from the beginning of time. Now the collectors may enjoy this sort of thing, but I know my wife wouldn't care for it if those started piling up around the house. So, um, you know, you know, you, you join, you're able to join when you're able to join, and also you're able to, uh, 
continue receiving stuff as it, as it becomes available, it's not good for that kind of thing. Completable futures aren't good for that. It's not good for latency sensitive data. You, you've got some information that you could process. It has an has a expiration date on it, uh, either conceptually or, or, or actually literally has an expiration date on it. And, and so you can process it as it comes along while it's still fresh, but, you, but not with a completable future because you're still having to wait until that wave complete gets called. And it's really, really bad again for large data sets because, or heaven forbid, in infinite, or at least theoretically infinite data sets. Data sets that may just keep on going forever. By the time you get around to receiving all this stuff, it's, it's old news. Okay, what about a Java stream? Well, Java streams are awesome. I love them. It took me a while to get my head around the, the programming model. I really think that uh, you know Josh Block could have, uh, uh, you know, some of the effective Java stuff he's he's written would have been helpful early on with this. But you know, now we're getting our head around it. We can write some good code. We can compose operations on it. Java streams are awesome, um, and they're really good. They're good for collections. Uh, you do get to process each item as it comes along. You can do that kind of thing. Um, it's not really good for hot data or latency sensitive data in general because the same sort of thing is, it, generally speaking, although there, I've, I've seen ways around this, generally speaking, a stream sort of gets baked up from a collection of data. You have to have that collection up front to, to create that. I have seen ways of feeding stuff to a stream, but generally you bake those up from some, from some set of data. And ultimately, again, each item, which is good, each item is processed asynchronously, but I put a notice up at a star by that. I'll explain that. And what I mean by that is, look at this first block. That's using a stream, and I'm telling it to do a mapping of each of the values. Now, these values are just a, a set of strings, things like uh, the names of fruit or whatever. Uh, and I'm doing an uppercase on them. As it turns out, this thing will block, and, and they will all all get processed in the calling thread. Everything happens in the calling thread. Yes, it's nice and it's, it's a stream. It's it's functional. It's it's you know it, it's very similar to what we're shooting for, but it still blocks. Now you can't go through a parallel on that, and then now each item will get processed in a separate thread. But ultimately, the calling thread still blocks until all of those individual threads have done their job. So. What about reactive? What can we do here? And so there's really two, cho two choices, uh, or two stories, I won't say choices, but two stories that have come along over the years. There's ReactiveX, um, and then ultimately RxJava. This gives us these observable streams, gives us a declarative programming model, gives us the ability to, uh, to work with uh, our data in a reactive kind of way. And then on top of that, we have this the reactive streams, which was uh, spoken about in the Java 9 presentation. It gives us asynchronous processing, but we have the back pressure. We have the ability to say, hold on a minute, I can't take any more. Or more accurately, I'm able to handle 100 things right now. I'm able to handle 1,000 things right now. Once I've, I've, I've handled those, I may come back and ask for more. I may request a few more, but until then, I'm able to handle 100. Start throwing 100 at me, and then I'll come back and ask for more. And then put those together in this project called Project Reactor. And what's really cool about Project Reactor, at least for a spring fanatic such as myself, is that the Project Reactor, uh, the, that, that project is from some of the, uh, the same folks that uh, work with spring. So it's all, we're all one big happy family in that regard. Now just in a nutshell, um, this is the Reactive Streams specification on a single slide. You have this thing called a publisher, publisher to publish things. And the way they publish them is to a subscriber. There's no point in publishing anything if you don't have a subscriber. So a subscriber comes along and says, hey, I'd like to subscribe. And it does this by calling subscribe and passing itself in. When that happens, the publisher will accept the subscription and say, on subscribe, giving back a subscription to the subscriber. And the subscription we'll talk about here in a minute. This is how the subscriber will control its subscription. And then as information comes along, the publisher will call things like on next or if there's an error, on error. And when that subscription is complete, there's no more data to be given on complete, saying there's nothing else left. Then you have the subscription. This is where, um, I think I have a little animation for this, there you go. This is where the subscriber can say, I would request so many, this is where I specify my back pressure. This is where I can say, I want 100 things, or 1,000 things, or what have you. And this is also where perhaps the subscriber no longer wishes to receive anything. Maybe there's still data to be had and the subscriber is done, it can say cancel. 
And then you have this concept of processor, it's fun to talk about. A processor is essentially a combination of subscriber and publisher. It subscribes to one thing and processes it and then produces or publishes something to some other subscriber. What's really cool about these is that although they're good to know and good to understand, and occasionally you'll work with them directly, when you start working with React, you don't work with them as directly as much as you, you'd like. One of the things you will see, though, is if you ever toss in, there's these, all these different operations you can toss on to a, um, some of the reactor types. One of them's called log. If you ever toss log on there, you see this stuff happening. You see like all of this stuff happening because it logs these details. So speaking of reactor, these are the key concepts that reactor provides. There's this thing called mono, which is zero to one thing or an error. Uh, there's also, the, it's, it's roughly equivalent to uh, what Rx calls a uh, single, or in the case of a mono of type void, a completable, just that you don't care what the type it is, you're just interested that it finish. Um, and then there's this thing called flux. I generally, I should probably talk about these in the reverse order because it's easier to understand. A flux is a zero to many things. They're, or zero to potentially infinite things. You might have an endless number of these things. You don't know when it's going to end, and, and that's OK. Uh, and it gives you a lot of different operations you can do on a flux. We'll talk about a few of those in a minute. Mono is easier to talk about once we talk about flux. And mono is essentially the same idea. Flux is a more generic generic purpose publisher. It's, it's for whatever type of, types of things you want to publish. A mono is a more specific type of uh, publisher is saying that we know how many we have. We're going to have zero things, we're going to have one things, so we're not going to error. Flux is more open-ended in that regard. And we start throwing operations on these, and again, I'll show you a few of these in a minute. We start throwing operations on these, generally speaking, there's exceptions, but generally speaking, whenever you op put an operator on top of a flux or a mono, what you get back is another flux and a mono, which means you can keep composing on these things. You say, as the data flows through this flux, do this to it, resulting in another flux, and now you have a whole new stream of data that you're going to potentially throw some other operation on. So this is a what we call a marble diagram. I stole this directly out of the reactor documentation. So if you don't like the picture, blame them, okay? <laughs> so, uh, but here's the, here's the marble diagram. Long and short, it works like this. You have some data. In this case, there's six items coming through in the flux. Six items come through the flux and you have some operator on it. And I'll just say that for the sake of discussion that a four, causes an error. So what we have is a new flux. We end up with a new timeline, a new flux that has one, it has two, it has three on it, or actually some, some result of doing an operator on those values. Four causes an error, and then the flux terminates because we had, a, we had an error. Or it could potentially complete, let's just say four didn't cause an error, then what you'd see is all, all of these flowing through, or at least the ones that are allowed to flow through, and eventually it comes to an end. Now, when you, I went today just because I was curious about it. I've, I've said this in passing a few times when I presented this before, and I just sort of waved my hand around it. I decided today to go take a look. And, I'll, and I didn't really you know, look in detail. I didn't read every single one of them, because that would take a lot of time. But I looked at the Java doc for Flux. There are approximately 350 methods on a Flux. Some of those may not quite be operators, but a good number of these are various operators you apply to that. I am not going to talk about all of those tonight. Just not gonna. Just for all the same reasons, I didn't count and look at them in detail to see what they did. I'm not gonna talk about them all. I will show you a few though. Just give me an idea what you can do. Mono is like the same idea, but now we know we're gonna have either zero item, one item, or an error. And it works the same way. We just know that because we know we're only dealing with a very finite, very finite number of items, there are some operations on a flux that just don't make sense on. And I copied and pasted this, obviously, so that should have said mono. There's, there are approximately 170 methods on a mono. And so there's a lot fewer, but still a lot. And we're not going to talk about it. So they're largely the same ones, though, that are on, on the flux. So just to give you an idea what some of them do, here's some more marble diagrams. I, I also stole these from the reactor to Java doc, so if you don't like them, same story there. But here we have a filter. Some of my favorite ones are, are filters. And what we have is a flux that has all these shapes coming through. We have green circles, we have red diamonds, blue squares, pink pentagons, and then a lighter green circle. And what we have is a filter where the predicate on the filter says, give me the things that are circles. And as a consequence of doing a filter on that flux, we get another flux. So data just is flowing through this thing, and as it flows through, 
we let through the things that we didn't match what we're looking for. We're looking for circles. I don't care what color it is. We're looking for circles. So when circles come through, we let that thing through. And now we can take what, what you don't see in these diagrams is you, is you don't see yet another operator that you can apply to what's, what's down there. You can keep building these things up. Oh yeah, it's also worth mentioning while we're here. Unlike a collection where we have all of these things available and we can just do like a for loop or a for each other or what have you to, to, to step through them all, there's no indication here that we're getting all these at one time. We're gonna get them as they show up. Now they may show up pretty quickly, one right after the other. They may not show up for two or three seconds between each other, for all you know. Just as they become available, we start doing things on them. We have a group buy. Now group buy is a lot of fun. Group buy says what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all the, the things as they come across and we're gonna create a flux of fluxes, and more accurately, a, group, a flux of group flux. And as these things come along, we're gonna create this whole new set of fluxes that we can do different things on. So what we're doing here is we're grouping them by their shape. So what we, what we end up with is we end up with a flux that has a bunch of group fluxes on it. But that doesn't hurt your head, by the way. I don't know what's done. You, you, you have a far stronger stomach than I do, really. But what you end up with a flux with, with the subfluxes hanging off of it where one of them's all the circles and one of them's all the squares because we're grouping them by shape. And then each one of those both, I have to point a little bit, each one of those, both this flux as well as each one of these individual fluxes, you can apply further operations on. Log, I, I spoke of log earlier. Now log doesn't result in another flux. It actually just returns a flux that's identical to the, the, to the source flux. But what's really cool about log is you can start tossing this on, onto a flux and as things happen, as things are requested, as things, as next is called, things like that, you'll see these things get, get locked. And you can kind of watch what's happening in the flux as it goes along. I, I do warn you, the very moment you put one of these on there, uh, your log file is going to get filled up really quick. Even if you have a simple flux, you're going to have lots of information on there. So you got to be prepared to, to be able to mentally digest that. You also have to warn you is where you put this kind of depends on which flux you put it on. Because if you have several operations all uh, kind of composed together, if you put them at the top, Flux, the very first source flux, what you're going to see is operations on that. You're not going to see anything else below it. If you start putting them lower, you're going to start seeing one of the lower fluxes. Map. Now, this is a simple one. I love map. I use it a lot because um, it's, it's just a common, it's a very useful thing. Um, so you have a flux, you have some things coming through. In this case, we have a bunch of circles coming through. And as the circles come through, we just map them. We map them from circles to squares. We map them from a um, from a string to a, you know, some product. We maybe the string is a skew and we look up a product and we end up with a result of a flux that is a flux of products that we looked up. Whatever. We take whatever it is and we transform it into something else. That's all it really is. And then there's my favorite one. And I swear, I have, every time I try to explain this to somebody, I, I get lost in my own explanation. So let me try. Flat map is fun. See, what flat map does is flat map allows you to map the entries as they, the, all the entries as they come along into a flux or into another mono. And then as those, those kind of internal fluxes sort of get built up, then you can flatten them back out into a single flux, which allows you, essentially what it allows you to do is do operations on those internal fluxes. But when it's all said and done, they all get sort of flat, flat mapped into a flat flux of whatever it is. Now that did not, in any way whatsoever help you in your understanding of life. <laughs> if anything, I've, I've probably done more harm than good. But I try. I have an example I can show you here in a minute that might make it a little bit, a little bit clearer. It's only a little bit. So I have a question. Sure. So uh, if you can only flat it after you map it, then why the uh, square in the middle and at the end seems out of Oh, place? because it, ultimately there's no guarantee of ordering. It's they, the, these individual these individual items that you're mapping and in these internal fluxes, it's as they get processed. So there's no guarantee. I mean, you end up, what you end up with is essentially internally you end up with three fluxes. Uh, a flux that has two, uh, is it? Yeah, two green squares, one with two blue squares, and one with two pink squares. However, those are being processed independent, potentially 
you know, different threads. And so as those fluxes become a bit, start making their data available, those get flattened out. So in this picture, what's happening is presumably the two green ones happen really quick. And so there's nobody, there's no contention, there's no threads racing against each other at that point. By the time we get to the blue and the pink ones, oh, there's a bigger gap in time there. By the time we get to the blue and the pink, those came along fast enough that one of the blues was processed pretty quickly, shows up, then one of the pinks was processed like right after that. So there's no, no guarantee that the ordering will stay the same. There's no guarantee that they're gonna just end up being you know, green, green, blue, blue, pink, pink. It just depends on how they show up, how they get processed, and when they're, as soon as those entries become available, they get dropped into the flat, into the flat flux. So there is a way, by the way, there is a way to, if you wanted to sort of guarantee that these happen, but it's not the flat map, you can do it. Uh, well, what can you do? There's a, uh, I can't remember the operation, but essentially it turns into a flux of lists. And then from those lists, you can start doing stuff like that, but not the flat map. And then there's take. I like take. I use take a lot. And the reason I use take a lot is because sometimes I have what I think to be either a very large or in potentially never ending uh, flux that's just never going to end. And so I'm saying, yeah, I don't care. I just want to see if this bunch of it works. If it works up to a certain point, I'm good with it. So I'll, I'll say take three, or take five, or take 10, or take 20, or however many I'm willing to take. And what ends up happening is we have a flux of data that's coming along. And you know what this picture doesn't show is there may be other data that's still coming, but we don't know that. And what happens is, is once I've received three, the, the, the source flux gets to cancel. The source flux is sold. I don't want anymore. I'm done. It doesn't mean there's no more data, it just means that that flux is, that subscription to that, that publisher has been canceled and I just don't receive anymore. All right, so again, there's like 350 flux operations, 170 give or take, uh, mono operations. This is just a taste of them. You'll see a few more as I show some examples in a minute. This is just a, a sampling. I'm not gonna go through all of them. But let me show you some code. So what I have here is a product repo where I'm going to go ask for all the products. Now, again, think for a moment. This could very well be, for all I know, Amazon's database. It could be Walmart's database, or it could be, you know, 7-Eleven's database, or it could be, you know, some mom and pop shop that only has like 12 items. I don't know. But we're getting, we're asking for all the products. Now, we're not asking for a list of products. We're asking for a flux of products, and it's a different thing because what, what's going to happen is that data is going to come along as it comes along. We're going to go and process it as it comes along. We're not waiting to compose this or, or collect this stuff into a big list before we can do anything with it. We're just, as the data becomes available, we're going to do something. And as it becomes available, the very first thing we do is we apply a filter. And all I'm saying here is I'm going to let this product go through if the name of the product has the word Star Wars in it. So as a consequence of that, I started off with a flux that is containing every, you know, that's going to let a, every product in my database flow through, my filter says, no, no, we're going to only let flow through what the, the products whose name is Star Wars. If they don't, then they just fall out. And that's going to result in another flux. And then I take that flux and I map it. And I basically take the product, so I, 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 get, take, I start with a flux of products, I end up after a filter with another flux of products, and it's a, it's a much you know, smaller set, but another flux that has products that are just Star Wars in it. And then I map it. And here I take the map, I take a, that product that's in it as it comes along, and I map it to a string. I just do some string concatenation, do something silly here. I say product, I give it the skew, dash, whatever the quantity on hand is. And then, just because I like to do this kind of thing, I put a log in there so I can see what's happening as it runs. And then here's the important part. Nothing happens until you call subscribe. And this is the number one mistake I make when I'm working with this stuff, is I forget to call subscribe. And I run it, and then I'm scratching my head, why, why is nothing happening? Because all I'm doing here is, essentially, the, the analogy I like to give is, let's just say, you know, I'm going to, obviously not at this time of year, I'm not going to do this, but uh, in the spring, I wanted to water my grass, and I don't, you know, I don't have a sprinkler system, let's say. So I go buy some hoses and some sprinklers at, at Lowe's, and I go hook them up to my faucet, right? I hook them up, and then I put a sprinkler at the end of that, and then I stretch another hose off that sprinkler to another one, uh, and then I hook up another sprinkler, and I have three or four of these sprinklers in the line here. 
and I've got them all hooked up, and yet there's no water flowing. Why? Because I haven't turned the faucet on yet. So subscribe is turning the faucet on. All this other stuff is just lighting the sprinklers up. Subscribe turns the faucet on, the, the data starts flowing, and things happen. And now I can compose on top of this. I potentially have asynchronous processing on each item. Uh, each item is processed as it becomes available, so it doesn't matter how many products I have, it doesn't matter, um, you know, this is a never-ending list, it doesn't matter if there's one, two, a thousand, or a billion products, I'm able to do them as they become available and as they get processed, they sort of drop off the stream and I'm getting new stuff all the time. Um, and because I'm processing them as they become available, I'm processing them while they're still fresh. I'm not waiting for everything to get collected. I process the data as it's, you know, fresh data as it comes in. And it works equally well when I'm dealing with one item, two items, or a thousand items. It's all the same as far as the, the programming model is concerned. Now, let's, let's uh, look at another example. Actually, I baked this one up today. I just did this one for fun today because I got uh, thinking, you know, this might be a more interesting example. So, for the sake of discussion, I'll actually show you this one running just to prove to you it works. Let's just say I have this inventory service. Inventory service is going to be able to look up a product's quantity on hand based on some SKU. I have a product service which is going to look up product details by SKU. Now for the sake of discussion, a product only has a name and a SKU. In this case, it's real simple just to keep it the, the example. You can imagine there being maybe being other information about a product there, but just to keep it simple. And what I've done is I've created a flux of just, flux, flux of just is when you're going to want to get to know when you do want to create a flux from a, from a, an array or from a list. It doesn't have to be created that way, but it sure is handy, especially for testing or for known finite values. Say flux, just, give it some skews. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flat map this thing. This is where flat map comes in. It's really interesting. I start off by creating a mono that, that, that's going to use the, uh, a, a, Starting with flat map, I'm well, back up. Flat map's going to be given a skew. I'm going to take that skew. I'm going to look up the product info from it. I'm going to look up the product inventory from it. But I'm not just getting product info in some integer that's quantity on hand. I'm getting monos out of those. And as a consequence of that, now I can take either one of those, but product info would make the most sense in this case. I'm going to take product info. I'm going to zip with, I'm going to zip that with the inventory info. So I've got a mono that's a product in info, a mono of product inventory, I'm going to zip this. So take the zipper, how the, the pieces of the zipper just sort of flow together. And so what I'm doing here is I'm given, when I do a zip with, I'm given for that product, I'm given its info model, I'm giving its quantity on hand, and then I'm able to take and create a new product that has all three of those fields. As a consequence of that, I'm receiving what comes out of this is a mono that has um, it's a model that has a product on it. Now, that subscribe one, I was just me playing around, ignore that. Let me show you that running. It's more fun that way. So, just, like I said, this is me just playing around with stuff. Um, this is pretty much the same code, but I purposefully put start and end on there just so you can see when this starts and ends. And I'm just going to run it. It's just the main method. There's no, nothing even terribly exciting about how I wrote it. So, product, main, and you're going to see that it started. I ended up taking those SKUs, the names, and I blended them together into a product information. So the resulting, the resulting mono is a mono of type product, not product info, not in integer. It's just zipped together into a mono of info. But notice that the, the result was it waited until I was done before it said end. And to kind of see that in, in more detail, put log on there. And so you see that they're all running on the main thread. Right here, here. It's all on the main thread. Everything happens on the main thread. So it's not necessarily asynchronous. In fact, in this case, it's not. What if I did this? Subscribe on. Schedulers. Dot, and I'll do parallel. And it just changes things. Now notice I'm putting the subscribe on here, on the, on the flat map not anywhere higher. So it, is, it does have some effect of where it takes place. But when I run it, you start seeing, first off, the end happened long before I was finished with it. You also see that each one of those got handled in a different thread. All in the same thread as each other, but different than the main thread. 
I can go even further, though. I can start tossing this around in other places, such as here and here. And now you'll see that, well, there's still the same idea. They all happen to run in, in parallel three. I started tossing this around in different places earlier and actually ended up confusing myself because it is a flat map after all. But um, you start seeing things happen on different threads depending on where you're putting these, this parallelism at. All right. So again, let's, let's talk a little bit about that subscribe on a little bit more. So I essentially recreated what I showed you with Java streams earlier. I recreated that, uh, but I did it with uh, Flux instead of stream. And so in this case, it's the same. I, it runs in the calling thread, and the main thread blocks until I'm done. So there's no guarantee that it's going to be asynchronous. In fact, in, in this case, it won't be. But then I throw a subscribe on. You got, what you gotta understand is subscribe on applies to the thread. When you're basically you're saying, when you subscribe to this flux, subscribe on it in a parallel thread. That's all I'm saying. When you subscribe to it, subscribe to it in a parallel thread. So Consequently, each one of these is going to be processed in the same thread, but that's not the same as the main thread because the flux, when I subscribe to it, I said, no, basically spin off another thread to work on this flux. Okay, so this is kind of, um, it doesn't block the main thread. The main thread will finish, but everything does get processed in the same thread. So each one of these items in the flux will be processed in, in the same thread without any parallelism amongst themselves. All right, so here's another couple of examples. In this case, I moved the subscribe on, not to be on the main flux, but indentation sort of hints to you here. It's actually being applied on the flat mapping itself. So when the flat map, which results in another flux, when that is subscribed on, fire off another thread. So consequently, the main thread is going to block until all the items are processed, but each item will happen potentially in a separate thread. And then there's the ultimate example down here. This is saying every item, everything coming out of flat map, that's going to be subscribed on separately. But, um, actually, I, I, I misspoke. The subscribe on is happening to the mono. Well, up there, the subscribe on is happening to the mono, not to the flat map. It's happening to the mono that's inside the flat map. So every one of these monos, as you're subscribing to those, as they're, as they're being processed, do those, spin those off in a separate thread. And, by the way, the main, the main thread, the, the main flux that's coming out of flat map, also do that in parallel. And when you do that, consequently, every item gets processed in a separate thread, and the main thread doesn't block because everything's spun off separately. So you can kind of control the parallelism that way. There's a lot more to, to doing parallel and some entangling the uh, parallelism than I have time for. That's just a little taste of it. So what does this, any of this have to do with Spring? Because this is the reactive Spring time. How am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing like wonderfully on time. This is normally an a hour and a half talk and I'm killing it so far. <laughs> Alright, so uh, usually I consume a lot more time. By the way, anybody here ever try to eat a clock? It consumes a lot of time. Very time yeah. Anyway, I had to kill some time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so here we go. Um, Consequently, what does that do to spring? Spring, spring 5 was released just over a month ago, Spring 5. It's actually Spring 501 now. Uh, and the, there's a lot of things to talk about in Spring 5, but the main story, the, the centerpiece of this all, was a, a supporting a reactive model largely based on what Project Reactor does. And kind of the centerpiece of this, the, the main thing we like to talk about is Spring Web Flux, which I'll talk about here in a minute. There's also Spring Boot 2.0, which is not yet GA, but it will be very soon. I think it's at Milestone 6 now. Like that. And then Spring Data, specifically Spring Data K, uh, the release chain on this K. It, for those of you who may not know, Spring Data is a umbrella project, covers a lot of different ground. Each one of the individual projects under the Spring Data umbrella is kind of released at its own pace, its own semantic versioning, and so forth. But every so often they kind of collect those under a release train. And in the case of Spring Data, they name those release trains after the names of uh, computer scientists whose names start with some successive letter of the alphabet. So we're at, coincidentally, K, the letter of the alphabet, and K, as in Alan K. So we're, we're kind of coincidentally have uh, both of those going on right now, which makes it terribly confusing, because it's like, what's Homer J. Simpson's middle name? J. So same thing here. Okay. 
Spring Security 5, which is also not uh, GA yet, uh, but it, it's, there's support for a reactive model there. Spring Cloud specifically, uh, I like to talk about Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Cloud Gateway. Uh, anybody here work with Spring Cloud Stream? Yeah, I wish I could talk about it tonight. I uh, don't have much time to even give it justice or otherwise I'll bring it up. But the idea of Spring Cloud Stream is a lot the same idea of, Spring, of, of, of Reactor in a way, except that instead of dealing with a stream of data that's in a flux, you're dealing with streams of data that are uh, being processed by, you know, for the lack of a better phrase, they're, they're microservices. But these microservices aren't necessarily REST oriented. They're just, you have these things called sources, you have processors, you have sinks, and you can string these things along. And so as data becomes through the comes through a rise, it kind of arrives through a source, it goes through some processor, it goes maybe to another processor, another processor, and eventually falls off into a sink. And so conceptually, at least on a, on, if I were to draw pictures up on a dry erase board, it would look a lot the same as the kind of pictures I would draw for uh, some of the reactive operations. But what made, what makes it interesting for, uh, for reactive and spring cloud stream is that those little microservices, as they receive their data, they don't have to wait for all the data to show up anymore. They can receive fluxes, and they can they can produce fluxes. And as a consequence, they you can you can have data flow all the way through a Spring Cloud stream stream, a defined stream, even though it's not all there yet. And you can have some bits of it already at the end, while some of it's still coming in. So you can have a kind of this big long pipe pipeline of data just flowing through uh, all these various uh, independently deployed and developed microservices. And then Spring Cloud Gateway, you ever use like Netflix Zool? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Uh, the difference between this and at least Zool 1, as Zool existed in, in, in its current version, is that uh, Gateway takes advantage of some of the reactive set. It's a more reactive uh, backend. And also, uh, just as a matter of programming model, I've, I've learned from what little I played with Spring Cloud Gateway is it's very much uh, coding heavy and not so much configuration heavy, where Zool is more configuration than it was coding. Um, I could be wrong about that. It's also still being worked on, so we'll see what comes out of it. And then there's you know, Spring Integration, naturally, as a kind of under, uh, some of the underpinning for Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Integration is going to have some of the uh, uh, reactive stuff in it. And ultimately, I, I just stopped there because I, I realized that ultimately, it makes, wherever it makes sense, eventually, the uh, Spring portfolio will have some adoption of uh, the reactive programming model, as it makes sense. So is this available now? Well, Reactor, as of I checked today, Reactor is at version 3.1.1. Spring Framework's at 5.0.1, so those are GA, ready to roll. Spring Data K is available, uh, GA. And it has Reactive support for Mongo, Cassandra, and Redis. If you're using a, rea a, a, a relational database with JPA, I'm sorry. And it's not, it's not so much Spring Data's fault. It's not really anybody's fault, really. It's just that we don't really have uh, very good uh, uh, reaction Reactive, sorry, reactive JDBC drivers uh, to underpin what JPA does. And so someday that may happen, or for the day, I'm sorry, if you're, if you're using a, you know, MySQL or Oracle or SQL Server and you're wanting to use a reactive model on top of that, it doesn't mean you can't. It just means that that layer is not going to be reactive. If that layer is going to be blocking. If that layer, you're going to have to wait for that, that data to all show up, and then you can program reactive on top of that. But today, that's not an option. Uh, Spring Security 5, which is currently at RC1, um, has a um, reactive model on top of it as well, and it's, uh, it's really nice. And what I'm going to show you, what happens pretty much in the rest of this talk, is going to be so boring, and I apologize for that. <laughs> and it's boring on purpose, though. It's, 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 it's exciting that it can do this, but it's boring from a programming model perspective, because as much as possible, the various teams developing these things try to stay consistent with what we, you already know and love. Try to not break the programming model. Try to give you something familiar to work with so that when you're working with Spring Web Flux, it looks like you're working with Spring MVC. When you're working with Spring Data and you're consuming data in a reactive way from Cassandra, it looks like you're writing a repository like you've already done with Spring Data. When you're working with Spring Security, it's very, very familiar, a little different. That was probably the most different of all of them that I've worked with, and even that's pretty familiar. So, with that said, can you write Spring and VC controllers with this stuff? And the answer to that is not really, but sort of. And I say that because it's not Spring and VC. And I'll explain what that means in a slide or two. But long and short of it, here's a uh, 
reactive controller. It's uh, a product controller. It handles requests where the, the, the request path all start with products. We have a get mapping that's going to return. So if you say get products, it's going to return all your products. A get products slash SKU is going to return a single product. Or if you say post uh, product, it's going to give it a save a product. But notice that when it's returning these things, it's not returning, in the case of the first one, a list of products or an iterable of products. It's returning a flux of products. And what this means is, although this doesn't really show it, I could, inside of my controller here, start layering, because it's a flux, I could start laying, layering operations on it if I wanted to. I could start putting filters or maps or whatever I want to in there before I return it out of my controller. Likewise, I don't return a single product here like I normally would. Instead, I'm returning a mono product. And the same thing there, I can compose additional operations on it. And finally, in the last one, I, I don't return a void, I return a model type void, essentially a completable for the RX Java folks out there. I'm simply saying, I'm going to save this thing, and I don't really care what the result is, I'm just going to save it, and this model is going to be able to tell you when it's finished, when it's completed. And what you don't see on this slide is the word subscribe. And the reason you don't see the word subscribe on here is because it isn't your business to do that inside a controller. The framework will do that for you. The framework needs to do that for you. Because the framework ultimately is going to be the one consuming this stuff and using it to render the results to the client. If you call subscribe on it at this point, you're going to break stuff. So you don't need to call subscribe in the controller. Let the framework do that for you. You're, and what's nice about this is you, I don't show you the whole picture here. I'll, I'll show you an example in a minute that does show you kind of everything all tied together. But what, you know, what you'll see here is that that repository, for all you know, is a string data K repository talking to Cassandra. And you've just fetched all the, the flux of products. And maybe you, you could do operations on it somewhere between here and there. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. But I'm just returning it straight through. You're not doing anything exciting, really, other than just you're returning fluxes and models instead of returning lists and single items. It's really the big difference in the programming model. What if you prefer Rx Java as observable and single or single? Sure, knock yourself out. Those also work. You have observable, you have single. If you prefer using completable instead of uh, mono void or single void, that works as well. Now it is worth talking about here what's happening when you do a, a blocking uh, versus not blocking on a post. In the first example here, what's happening is I just simply ask it for a request body to be bound to the, to the type product. And consequently, the request has to be fully resolved before that method gets called. In the second example, I'm asking for the request body to be bound to a mono type product. As a consequence of that, the request may not have been fully resolved yet. It may not have been bound to the product yet. It doesn't, doesn't matter. I get, I, I, this gets called right away. I use that mono to say, okay, once you've received it, then save it. And I return that mono. For all you know, this, this method is completed and moved on. It, it's, it's already run its course and moved on before that request even is fully resolved into a product. So how does this relate to Spring MVC? Well, this is what I talked talk about earlier. Yeah, you can write stuff, stuff in the Spring MVC programming model, but it's not Spring MVC. It has a lot of the same annotations, controller request mapping, get mapping, post mapping, delete mapping, all those annotations, we rest controller, things like that that we've been using in Spring MVC. Those are the same. And so if you're using Spring MVC, you can continue using those. It's going to be built on the servlet API. And with your, if you apply it, you have a servlet container, like Comcat or uh, Jetty or WebSphere or something underneath that. And you can still do that. So basically, everything on the left side there, in kind of the pale blue or aqua, or whatever you want to call that, that's what we've been using all along in Spring MVC. On the right side, excluding the top right, which I'll talk about in a minute, we have Spring WebFlux, which is essentially Spring MVC. Now, I'm not even going to try to explain the reasons behind this. If you want to know the reasons why it's a separate framework, hey, Rawson's back there. Um, but in short, my understanding of it is that it just became too, it's, it was too much to try to have a single framework that does both of those things, put it, put it succinctly. Because handling, uh, blocking, servlet-based um, requests versus handling non-blocking, not necessarily servlet-based requests, it's a different enough concept that having a complete, trying to kind of merge them into the single framework uh, was, was just too much. It would have been too messy, too complex to do so. And so 
to separate frameworks, but as much as possible, reusing some of the same common stuff, such as the annotations. Underneath that, because there's no assumption that you're working with servlets, although you might be, there's no assumption you're working with servlets, we have this thing called reactive HTTP API, which essentially is the, it's, it's the non-servlet equivalent of the servlet API. It's a more generic, more reactive approach to giving you some of the same information, some of the same operations that the servlet API would give you without the assumption of the servlet underneath. And then underneath that, you have all these different types of containers you can deploy to. Sure enough, you can deploy to a servlet 3.1 container, Tomcat and Jetty, and so forth, but there's no assumption that you have to. It could be under tow, it could be Jetty. There's options there. And then there's the top right. I'm going to save that one. Hang on. Can I stream data to the client? Now, I'm going to show you that I think I have this one available to run for you. If not, I have one very similar to it that's even cooler than this one. Um, this is a hands down some of the most useless and yet you know, so, I was so satisfied after I had written it. I just felt so good about myself after I wrote this. Because what I was able to do is I was able to write this code which basically says I'm going to create a flux that's based on an interval. So essentially what I'm saying here is I, every one second I want to toss a number into the flux. So this flux potentially could go on forever. There's no ending to it until the app dies. I'm just saying basically every one second toss a number into it. So it's going to start off, I think it starts with zero, zero, and then a second later, one, and a second later, two, and so forth. And then I, I take that, those numbers and I map them to this, this new object. I, created this, I just created an object called server time. It's my own creation. You don't see it here, but it's just, it's a simple class that has two properties. It has that number in it, plus it also has the current time in millis. And I just return that as a server, server sentiment. Actually, the way I've done this more recently is even cooler than this. It's actually a lot less code. But when I first wrote this, this little bit of code here, and I first did a curl to it, and I first, well, there's a little bit more that this slide also doesn't show you. I first also told it what, what the accept header should be, and I started receiving this data every one second on the, re on the response. It's so awesome. It occurred to me I'm able to write streaming code now. Things that seem like just black magic to me until this, it suddenly was just a piece of cake to do it. What if you prefer a functional model? This is the top right of that, that diagram a few slides ago. So, how many of you worked with Spring and VC for any period of time whatsoever? How many of you have worked with some other language or framework or, or you know, some other programming platform where instead of annotating things to the angel request, you basically sort of create sort of this, this routing. You say, okay, it's sort of like this, you say, when a get request comes in for such and such, then I want you to call this method. You may have done anything like that before. Yeah, I've done some of that too. I don't really like it myself, but I've done some of that too. Well, consequently, uh, because we now have this, this whole new React, this functional model that's part of uh, Spring, you can do the same thing here. Now, I'm not a big fan of this. This is not my, this doesn't feel natural to me to write code this way, but it's not that hard. It's not that hard at all, and some people are gonna feel very comfortable with it. Some people coming from another another platform, another framework, might look at this and say, oh yeah, I get this. This is exactly what I, I've done before. So yeah, I understand this. I can do this. And so it's, it's a more welcoming option for some folks. Or maybe it's not some, something you've done before, but you may find it interesting. So essentially what I've done here is I've, I've created this, this router functions object where I'm basically saying anytime a get request comes in for hello, call the hello method. And there's the hello method. It's just straightforward. I can, I can start. Uh, stringing these things together, I can continue on that router to finding other types of requests, like get requests for goodbye or a post request for something or what have you. I can still string those things along and build up a, a uh, complete web application this way. Seems weird to me. I'm used to the annotation model. I'm sort of uh, old dog new tricks when it comes to that kind of thing. But this is not bad. Just not my, my cup of tea. Can you write reactive web rest lines? Actually, this slide needs a, a good freshening up. It's not actually even accurate these days. So let me show you a better example in a minute. How about Spring Data repositories? Again, this, this came about in Spring Data K. It's only good for Mon Mongo, Cassandra, and Redis because those are the databases that Spring Data works with that offer a reactive option. And it really comes down to instead of extending CRUD repository, you're extending reactive CRUD repository. Instead of returning a product, you return a mono of product. Instead of returning a list or an interval of products, you return a flux of product. But other than that, the programming model is 
exactly the same. Like I said, this is the boring part of the talk. Just change a few types and you're, and you're, you're in business. Can you secure things? Absolutely. So it's, instead of doing enable web security and it, instead of some of the stuff you might have done with spring security, you say enable web flux security. And you create a being type security web filter chain and you start just building up your uh, security model. In this case, I'm just simply saying, hey, um, any request for slash profile slash username, whatever the username just comes in, uh, we're gonna define its access with a, previously you could define access using like a Spring expression language expression, and now you can use a Lambda. So I'm gonna basically be given uh, this mono, which is the, essentially is my user information, and then context, which is the security context, and I can start, oh, I'm sorry, not security context, it's the context of that request. I can start applying what are my security rules on it? And build that thing up, and now I've defined security. It's similar to what we've already done with Spring Security, and uh, it's slightly different in that we're dealing with enable web flux security instead of web security. <coughs> um, it's a little different in that we're creating a being of type security web filter chain as opposed to some of the other uh, baked in methods we might have overloaded in previous versions. But it's better in the sense that now we can use uh, lambdas or method references instead of. Uh, spring ex expression language expression, so that's kind of nice. And uh, but otherwise, it's basically the same as we've already seen before. Now, quickly, is this a silver bullet? Absolutely not. I hate when people ask the question, "Is it a silver bullet?" Now, excluding myself, who just asked you, "Is this a silver bullet?" <laughs> Most people who ask you, "Is this a silver bullet?" are trying to sell you something that's not this thing. I'm actually trying to convince you I like this stuff, but it's not a silver bullet. You shouldn't use it on everything. There's certain certain use cases that just simply don't need it. When you do find yourself using it, though, it is best to not just be a little bit reactive. It's not that you can't be. It's just you don't get the full benefit of it when you're not web, uh, not reactive front to back. So if your repository, for example, is still a JPA repository, it's not reactive. It doesn't mean you can't once you get that collection of products turn it into a flux and then have a reactive programming model up there. It doesn't mean you can't process those asynchronously once you receive them. I'm just saying that you still have that blocking at that one point. Once you have blocking, you, at, at some point you effectively block everything else, at least until you get to the, all that information. So I'm out of slides, but I'm going to show you some code real quick. But before I co close my slides, thank you very much. Check out my books. They make great gifts. My mom likes them. She has them on her uh, coffee table, and uh, I know they're there every time I go over. So let me show you something I baked up today. I already showed you this example. This one's fun. Um, let me show you another one. And this one I, I've tinkered with a lot today, so I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if it quit working while, while people are watching. But I've got this thing called reactive books, and I'll go ahead and kick it off and get it running, and I'll show you what we got here. What we have here is we have a book, and this is essentially it's not really an entity in a Java in a JPA sense, but for, I'm going to probably use the term entity anyway. It's a book entity. It has a four fields. It has an ID, as ISBN, a title, and author. But it's the way I've annotated it is for persistence in a Cassandra database. And I do have Cassandra running on this machine, so that's going to make it work really well for me. And nothing terribly special about this. This is just how you would do Spring, how you would annotate stuff using Spring Data Cassandra to be persistent to a Cassandra database. My repository is slightly more interesting, but only slightly so, is it is using Spring Data uh, Cassandra, and specifically Spring Data Cassandra from, uh, well, from Spring Data K, but actually the more I think about it, it's not even using Spring Data Cassandra, it's actually using Reactive Crud Repository. So there's nothing Cassandra about this thing. This would work equally well with Mongo or Redis if I had the types right. But Reactive Crud Repository, which means I'm going to have reactive stuff. I have a find by ISBN that's going to return a single book as a mono. I have a find by author that's going to return zero to many books as a flux. I'm not, I'm not going to wait till they're all there, though. I'm just going to return the flux. That flux may go through to a controller. That controller may go through to the framework. And then somebody's going to call subscribe on that, turning on the faucet, and data's going to flow through. OK? And then I have this, this books controller. And books controller is just a simple spring or spring web flux <coughs> controller. It's going to handle get request for slash books. It's going to handle get request for slash books slash ISBN. And then I post mapping to save a book. For the most part, for, for tonight's discussion, we'll ignore these two methods. I'm not even going to use them. This is the one I'm interested in. So keep in mind, 
the data is coming out. In fact, let me take this, this one line out for now. This is the, I'm going to actually build up some of the suspense here. All this data is coming out of the database. Not necessarily all in one big lump. It's coming out as, it, as the database makes it available to me. It's pretty fast. So it appears to be one big lump, but it's really coming through in a flux. Books are showing up. One book, then another book, then another book, then another book. I'm returning that flux of books from my controller. That goes to the framework. The framework can render it however it sees fit. And so if this is running right now, and I were to do this, so I would say curl localhost 8080 slash books, notice I received in JSON format a, 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 an array of all those books. Like it looks like I got them in one, one clump, right? In fact, that's exactly what happened as far as curl is concerned. I received an array of books all at once. So it was reactive from the database, it was reactive through the repository, it was reactive through the controller, uh, it was reactive right up to the point where Spring Web Flux rendered it, and at that point, because curl said it wanted JSON back, it sort of waited and collected these things up. It, it essentially blocked until they were all available, and then it returned them. But here's what's cool. What if I did this instead? Not application JSON, but application stream plus JSON. Notice that it's on an array of books. It's four distinct entries of books, which they all look like they came at the same time. So maybe maybe the, the illustration is not that great. But before I show you what I really want to show you, let's pop up. Incidentally, those books, Knitting with Dog Hair and Crafting with Cat Hair, real books. They're on Amazon. <laughs> Those are the real author's names, the ISBNs on meetups, so I couldn't remember. So when I go to my UI, here's some books for your reading list, there you go, and there they showed up, it listed them out. And so when I say refresh, bam, I get them all at once, right? It looks like I'm getting them all at once. In reality, I'm not, though. In reality, the way this client's coded, I'm not getting them all at once. I'm getting them as they become available. To make that point, to drive that point home, let's go back and put in this line I took out. So I'm putting a two second delay between each one. So I'm getting it from the repository as a flux, a book, and then as I'm dealing with them, I'm going to delay them on the return flux every two seconds. The return flux is going to get a, get a book, two seconds later, do another book. All right, to prove that, let's do this again. As they become available, they show up. So I purposely put in that delay just to slow things down, to prove that they're not all showing up all at once. They're showing up as they become available. And when you go to the client, do the same thing. The client's dealing with them the same way. Now, by the way, I'm just using jQuery here. jQuery plus a little mustache templating. So nothing terribly uh, groundbreaking in what I'm doing, although the jQuery that I needed to actually deal with streams like that not as easy as you might think it should be. So it's, little, it's harder than dealing with it as one big one, but it, it is possible. Yes? Question. Um, let's say you want to extend that. You just want your curl to be open, and you want to see everything that comes in. From now to forever? Yeah. How would you that, the, like same, it, the same thing. It's just it looked it, like it ended, the curl. It did end because eventually I ran out of data. But okay. if I had a flux that didn't end? Well, you know, you end, but you want, if something comes in in a minute, you leave it open, you want to see it. Well, see, that's the thing, is if, it, if the flux ends, the stream ends, and there's no more data. And so, consequently, the client sees that there's no more data, the connection closes, there's no more data. If you, if you expect that more data will come, you'll just have a flux that never ends. You'll have an open-ended flux. And so, for that, I actually I do have an example. I have to go find it. Um, let's see. I'll just go in the right spot. There we go. Maybe. Well, come on. The yeah, IDE is trying to be smarter than me. So let's just do it this way then. Uh, let's see. Streaming demo. This is more or less the uh, example that I have on the slide. Tweaked a little bit, but more or less the same example. And so my controller basically 
it produces, in this case, I don't even have to tell it what the header or what the accept is because it's just going to produce application stream plus JSON. The default accept header that curl gives it matches that just fine. So I, didn't have, I won't have to tell it that. But the, the key thing to take in mind is down inside, I have an interval of every one second. I'm going to map that to an entry object that's going to have current time abilities. This is kind of like what I have on the slide, a little bit different. But for now, I'm going to take this, this one out. Okay, and to, to show you how this works, I'm going to kill this. I'll start this one once that one dies. Kill this one. And I'll say curl localhost 8080. And every one second, I'm going to get one of those. And if I don't stop it, it's going to go forever because that flux is never ending. Now, that flux is only producing data every one second, but that's only because that's the kind of interval I gave it. If some data came along, it was some, whatever my source of data was is more inconsistent. It just, I'll get one every second, one every five seconds, maybe I don't see another one for a full day. That flux will stay open until I explicitly tell it to go away. If you wanted to implement um, a database retrieval, I was a little bummed when you said that uh, reactive stuff wasn't available for um, relational databases, but you would just query the database, return everything in the flux, keep the flux open somehow, and then, then you'd have to you know, sleep for a period of time or whatever. You just look, are, you, are you trying to get a, trying to solve the problem where data shows, more data gets inserted yeah, so later and then you return that? Yeah, I'm not um, sure, honestly, I'm not even sure if that's possible. Because I mean, the idea is you have, you still have, at the time of query, you have a finite set of data, maybe a large set of data, but you have a finite set of data. And so that flux will ultimately get, you would need a website. Yeah, and well, I mean, you don't need WebSockets to do this. This is kind of like acting, yeah, no, pretending to be a WebSocket. But for what you're asking for, yeah, you would probably want something. So yeah, where instead of what I'm thinking, the idea you talked about Spring Cloud and the various microservices. I'd love to have you know, those millions of rows and, and the various microservices just processing them as they come in. That's sure. Really and and you could do that by just leaving the flux open. But uh, I'm just going to say it depends on the use case. I may or may not know the answer for that. I mean, so, it Mongo, may or may not be possible. Mongo, but Rossum has an answer. Mongo has a tailable collection. It does? Just like that. Okay. It's, um, it never ends. And then as things get inserted into the collection, you get that response. Ah, I did not know that. That's good to know. See, now I'm going to have to go back to my hotel room and try that. <laughs> in yes. the same place where you put the generator of the seconds, couldn't you put a pub sub in there, like a traditional JMS, whatever, pub sub? So you're monitoring the database, and when changes sure. occur, you just push sure. it down the flux, you can, right? You can do that. You can let the publisher, you can let that flux be populated from... It's subscribing to some from publish something event else. that the database changed, and then... Yeah, you can do that. I don't see why not. There's a question back here first, though. Where is it? There it is. Um, you said that the flux on the other can build any handlers for contingencies, such as like if uh, the data is corrupted or if stops in one place and it has to pick up at another place, so like a bookmark inside of the database. Is that built in? No, I don't believe there's anything built in. You can certainly code something in there. You can code your own behavior in there and do that kind of thing. I saw an example earlier today and I was tempted to share it with everybody, but it wasn't my example. I didn't fully understand it and it was, it was, it was far hairier than I knew I was going to have time to explain, but it actually did some sort of error handling. It is not what you said, but something similar to that. It was able to deal with data it came across that wasn't quite what it wanted and able to recover from that in the course of handling the flux. It was, it was very scary to the flux code, but it, it, it's, I understood what it was doing when I read it. It made sense. I probably didn't have explained it to you, but I understood what was happening. So yeah, you can do that kind of stuff. You can code that kind of stuff at, in the course of processing flux. I don't believe there's anything baked in for that. You have to use some of these existing operators to deal with that. So I was thinking this, that this is something kind of like you know, HTTP there. Yeah, the same way I'm coding this is this is, yeah, it is over HTTP, it is a GET request, but it's an open GET request. That connection remains open. Eventually, that connection may just go away. Um, which, if you're expecting that the connection remain open sort of indefinitely, uh, maybe this is not the best way of doing it. That's where something on WebSocket might be better. And WebSocket, theoretically, could be fed from this step, too. So. Yes, I, I, I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> so he, he's saying this, which means touchdown, I think, or something like that. But, um, yeah, notice this is still running. Uh, so I'm going to leave you with one quick thought. If I were to put this back in, I'm, I'm just telling it 
to wrap itself up after five. So you're going to get five of these things, and it's all going to be done. At least I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. Never mind. Really. So, uh, my best example, it's not my best example, but uh, the one that failed right before we're done. So. Um, uh, quick, quick story. Uh, have you heard about the guy who his left half cut, accidentally cut off? He's all right now. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.